thanks for watching this today. I uh, hope you did well. hope this is a helpful uh, time thinking about this bit of God's word. One of the things that I want to start with thinking about is the fact that during this pandemic, it's really highlighted the fact that what people believe affects how they behave. What people believe affects how they behave. So we saw it six months ago at the start of lockdown when it was, the threat of it was looming. People who believe there would be a shortage of toilet roll went out and bought shed loads of toilet roll. And if even now you believe coronavirus isn't as bad as everyone says it is, then you're going to be more relaxed and casual with following the rules and wearing a mask and how many people you hang out with. And if you believe that driving 300 miles in a car with your child in the back to a castle is the best way to test your eyesight, that's what you're going to do. Outside of the pandemic, if we believe that something we've watched or we've listened to is really, really good and people would like it, then we're going to want to tell them about it. If you know me at all, you know that's very much what I'm like. I'm prone to obsession. My current one, by the way, is Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, the musical that they've filmed a stage production of. It's incredible. It's brilliant. I'm very late to the party. But spend any time with me at the moment, and you'll know that I think it is brilliant. And that means I'll talk to you about it. So sorry if that happens to you. But the truth is, what we believe affects how we behave. The Apostle Peter knew that. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of, probably one of his better-known disciples. And he's the guy that wrote this letter we're studying today and at the moment. It was written to a load of first century churches. They were spread across Roman provinces in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, probably made up of a mixture of people from religious Jewish backgrounds and people from unreligious Gentile non-Jewish backgrounds. And in the first 12 verses that we looked at last week, Peter's reminded his readers what Christians believe, what we should all believe about our identity as Christians and what God has done for us. He told us that we are people who've been reborn to a living hope and that that hope is something unperishable and that's kept safe for us even though we might go through times of trial and suffering now. He reminded us that relative to eternity, those times of suffering will only be for a little while, which Richard really encouraged us with last week. He ended in verses 10 to 12 by saying this salvation that we now know about, this hope we've got for the future, was a mystery for such a long time. The Old Testament prophets, they searched to try and understand it, but it's been revealed to us in these what he calls last days. And that's what we believe. But if you read that and you thought, ah, oh, sweet, it's all done. God's done it all. Nothing for me to do. Problem solved. In one way, you'd be right. But in another way, you wouldn't be right. Because what we believe affects how we behave, if we really believe it. And so from verse 13 onwards, Peter goes to great lengths to show how these truths are going to affect how we behave. He moves from describing gospel truths to giving us commands. Hence that word at the start of verse 13, therefore. Therefore, because of all this stuff I've just told you about who you are and what God has done for us, this is what we should do. This is the right response to knowing all of the truth. And that's what Peter begins to talk about in our reading today, which Jamie's going to read for us now. Today's reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 13, to chapter 2, verse 3. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. 
the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. There's a lot in there, right? I think if you wanted to summarise everything that Peter says in this section of the letter and probably for the rest of the letter, the command he gives, you could find it in verse 16. Be holy as God is holy. Be holy as God is holy. Now that is a huge command, isn't it? And thankfully Peter doesn't only say that. He says a lot more. And we're going to see four things today that Peter tells us to do. Four commands. He tells us to hope fully, live purely, walk reverently, and love deeply. And all of those are aspects that lead towards that bigger goal of living holy lives. So firstly, Peter tells us to hope fully. Have a look down at verse 13. He begins by saying, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Therefore, he says, as a result of all those incredible truths in the first 12 verses, set your hope on that grace that's coming to you. Now that phrase, with minds that are alert, is a really vivid image in the original. It literally means, gird the loins of your mind. If you've got a King James Bible, you'll have it there. This is a picture from the Middle Eastern life that everyone would have got in those days. People wore long flowing robes at that time. But if they wanted or needed to get somewhere quickly or urgently, they'd have to tie them up out of the way. They'd have to gird up their loins. They had to prepare themselves for what they needed to do. And what Peter's saying here is that we need to engage our minds and consciously choose this fight and be ready for this fight. You see, if you're a Christian, you're in a constant daily battle for your hope. So we need to engage our minds. We need to be alert. We need to have our minds ready for this fight for holiness. That's where the battle for holiness begins, is in our minds. And Peter tells us what we're to prepare our minds to do. He says, prepare your minds to set your hope on the future that phrase set your hope though is a little bit confusing isn't it like normally when we hope for something it means we're not certain about it so um no i hope it'll be nice weather this weekend means i want there to be nice weather but i don't know whether there will be or not we hope for a covid vaccine soon but we've got no certainty of that sadly but that thankfully isn't how the word hope is used in the bible you see in the bible the word hope it isn't just a desire for something good to happen in the future but without any certainty. No, it's a confident and certain expectation that something good is going to happen in the future. And so that's what we're to do. We're to set our minds fully on the hope, the incredible good that we know is promised coming to us in Christ, as Peter's just described to us. If we're Christians, that is the only way that we can endure and get through all of the battles and the trials and the ups and downs that life will throw at us is to set our hope on that certain future Jesus has won for us at the cross. That living hope, the inheritance that can never perish, never spoil or fade, that is kept in heaven for us who are shielded by God's power until we go to take hold of it. Peter's really emphatic here. Other versions of verse uh, 13 say this, set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you. Fully. And that is really important because Peter knows that we're so prone to putting our hope partially in this promised future. We so easily and so often put our hope in so many other things that are just going to disappoint us ultimately. Friends, family, relationships, youthfulness, popularity, marriages, careers, gifts, talents, abilities, our bank balances, our nice houses. We put our hope too much in our own ability to be able to control our little worlds despite constant reminders from life circumstances that we just haven't got the control we think we have. I mean, COVID alone has reminded us of that, hasn't it? And it isn't, by the way, that we shouldn't enjoy those things or that we shouldn't be disappointed when those things do go badly or hurt us. But the problem is if we put our hope in them rather than just enjoying them as gifts from God, they'll only fail us and we'll be left hopeless. Peter makes it really clear that in verse 18 that those things are perishable. They're going to fade 
And he's already told us back in verse 4 that what we should be hoping in is, is completely unperishable. It isn't going to fade even a little bit. It isn't going to let us down. Even though everything else and anything else we put our hope in so often will. So the battle begins in our minds to set our hope on the future promise that we have daily. That's why so many Christians throughout the centuries have begun their day by reading the Bibles and praying. It starts the day by engaging the mind, readying it for battle ahead, helping us put our hope solely in our future promise. But whatever works best for you, it's the battle we all face to hope fully in God and not anything else. That is what God's saved and forgiven people do. So Peter commands us, hope fully. But he moves on to say that also God's people live purely. God's people live purely. We've already mentioned it in verses 15 and 16, the whole crescendo of maybe the whole letter. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So, that's pretty straightforward, right? Just be holy in all you do, like God does. Simple. Except we know it isn't simple. We know this is a huge command. And therefore it's a command that, in truth, feels a bit overwhelming, doesn't it? If you're anything like me, it feels like those adverts that you get for diets or for exercise regimes or gyms, where the people on there look so toned and beautiful and so perfectly done, you think, why are you even bothering going to the gym? You've finished. You've completed that game. And I look at them and think, yeah, that's a great idea. Clearly exercise is a good thing and dieting is a good thing, but I'm never going to get to your point, so why bother? It all feels a bit overwhelming. It seems impossible. Nice idea, but no chance, so I don't even bother. And my brain goes a bit like that with this command. It's a quote from the Old Testament. Your footnotes might say that. It comes from Leviticus 11 or 19. But if you read through the whole of the Old Testament, you'll see that this is something God calls his people to do over and over and over again. Like Peter's not presenting new revelation and new information here. He's reminding us and his readers that this is what God's people have always been called to be because we represent him and he is holy. There's a lot that we could say about what God's holiness is and we haven't got time so I'm going to have to give a very brief and inadequate definition about this but being holy at its simplest means being separate, other, different, set apart for a different use particularly when it comes to doing right and wrong so God is holy, completely holy, completely separate, completely sinless and always righteous when uh, objects are declared holy for use in the temple in the Old Testament, it's because they're set apart, they're special, they are used for a special job. They're different. And this is what God commands us as his people to be, separate, different, set apart for a special purpose. In fact, Peter's reminded his readers already, and will remind us again, that this actually is what we already are. He tells us a little bit later on, we already are a holy nation. So, what he's telling us to do here is simply live out what we are. Don't be like everyone else. We're not everyone else. We are wholly distinct. We are a separate nation of people. So be it. Be different. Be holy. Now we know that we can't be holy as God is holy in the sense of always being perfect and right. We know that's a battle that we can't win. But... That doesn't mean we're not to pursue holiness, because we are. We're to pursue it and we're to fight sin like we're in a battle. We're to take captive anything we think or do or say that goes against what God wants us to do. We're to pursue holiness at all costs because we are holy. We are set apart. Like Peter heard Jesus teach this when he said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Fight this battle as God's people we do have a different purpose to people who aren't God's people. That's why Peter tells us to get our minds ready, because the battle for holiness begins in our minds. He says in verse 14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You see, the opposite of holiness is just doing whatever we feel like whenever it comes up and we feel like doing it. Whatever pops into our minds. Living a just-do-it life. Now, that's the life people in the world lead, people who don't know Jesus, but... We're not to be like that. We're to be like obedient children and pursue holiness. Now, that picture of obedient children might be one some of us can only imagine. But whatever level of obedience we currently have from our children, if we have them, just think what kind of obedience you want from a son or daughter. 
You see, with Aoife, I don't want her to begrudgingly obey me just because of a fear of consequences. No, I want joyful obedience out of gratitude and love for me. So I don't want to be constantly nagging Aoife to get her pyjamas on or get her teeth clean or else she'll lose a story at bedtime. No, what I want is for her to go and get her pyjamas on and clean her teeth because she knows it will make me happy and she knows that I ask for good things from for her. And I only want good things for her because I love her. That would be the dream. Any parent watching will know that sort of thing. And that's the reason we should pursue holiness at all costs. Like we're fighting a war in everything we think, say or do. Because we know that our Heavenly Father loves us and wants good things for us. So we should obey him. Out of thankfulness and gratitude and love for him. Peter knows this is a battle. And that it's hard. And in truth he knows that it's easier not to fight. But if we love God, if we know the truth... We will want to be like obedient children who know that our Heavenly Father loves us and has prepared something for us that far outstrips any suffering we might have to go through in this life or any pleasure we might get in this life for a little while. So he encourages us to keep our eyes fixed on the goal, that inheritance is waiting for us. I was once at a conference where the preacher addressed the young people particularly and he said, imagine you've come home from school. And your mum says, this steak, this is yours, I'm going to start cooking it, take a little while, it's yours. But you're a bit hungry now. You know that steak's coming for you, but you're a bit hungry now, so you open the fridge and you pick at the wafer-thin ham, you know, the little naff ham you get that's full of water. That doesn't satisfy you, you're just picking at it, and you're going, it'll do for now. Why? That steak is coming, the preacher said. Why would you fill yourselves up and ruin your appetite on things that aren't going to satisfy you as much as that steak? He says, smell the steak. And that's what we need to do with heaven. If you're a vegetarian, choose a different food. We need as Christians to smell the steak. Because heaven is coming and it's going to satisfy us far more than anything this earth can give us. So as Christians, as forgiven, holy people, we are to live holy, pure lives. But the third thing Peter commands us here is that we also are to walk reverently. Walk reverently reverently i'm getting that from verse 17 since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear at the start of that verse peter reminds our readers that god is both a loving father and a just judge now we need to know that if we're a christian he's judged our sin and has punished it fully on jesus at the cross and he's removed it totally from us he's not unjust but Peter reminds us of who God is in this verse in a way that might make us feel awkward, which is the, the kind of constant tension we have when we're reading the Bible. So as you read it, you see God as the, the loving, approachable, cuddly daddy God, while also seeing at the same time him as the almighty creator who's enthroned above the cherubim. That's a big tension. How do we address God? Add to that tension the impact that our own relationships with our earthly fathers are going to have on how we view God. That's a really difficult thing to balance. And I'm not going to try and address that here. But Peter's particular emphasis here is that he wants us to remember to reverently fear God. Not fear him like we would a brutish dictator, but instead fear and respect his decisions and leading and guiding more than anything else. The truth is we live in a world where we could fear any number of different things at the moment, don't we? The news itself is terrifying enough without adding in all of the uh, different theories and ideas that float around. The same was true of Peter's readers. They'd been scattered by the persecution Saul had kicked off and the world around them was growing increasingly hostile to them. But what Peter wants to remind them and us is this. Fear the right things. Fear the right things. So fear God above everything else. What he's saying here is, why would we as Christians fear the shifting sands of culture when our God is the rock of ages? Why would we fear the words of politicians when the word of the Lord endures forever? Peter is telling those living in exile that they are not to be characterised by a fear of man or of anything in this life. Instead, they're to be characterised above all by the right reverence and fear of God. We spend so much time trying to manage all of the things around us that we can, thinking it depends on us or, or on a vaccine or on a political decision, when in truth it all depends on the Rock of Ages, who always acts impartially. And I want to encourage you, God is not stressing about how life is like at the moment. He isn't wringing his hands and worrying. 
We need to be reminded of that. We can trust him fully. God's people shouldn't be running around like chicken little, worried that the sky is falling in on their heads. We have the bigger picture. Through the Bible, we see behind the curtain. We see that our God is still on the throne and we know how the story ends. Yes, we can and we will have concerns and worries and hurts and anxieties. That's not wrong. But if they trump our faith and our hope and our trust and our fear of God, then we need to spend more time looking at him and less time looking at Facebook. Like living that way, verse 18, is the way handed down to us by the people that came before us. And it didn't help. It didn't save anybody. In fact, it just made things worse. And us as Christians, instead, we trust in something we can't see that makes no sense to a world around us. We trust in the death of a sacrificial lamb of God in our place on the cross. And that is what saved us. And even that, verse 20, it wasn't God's plan B. As baffling as that can be to us sometimes... It was always God's plan before the foundation of the world to save his people that way. All of the history of the Old Testament was building, building, building until when, verse 20, he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times. You might think, why did God wait so long? Peter tells us he was revealed in these last times for your sake. For your sake, for my sake, for our sake. God sent Jesus and revealed his plan at the time he did for us. Peter here is reminding his readers and us why it's so important we set our hope fully on the things we should and the reason we should live purely and walk reverently. Because the price paid for it and the price paid for us deserves it. So we are to hope fully. We are to live purely. We are to walk reverently. So... What does that look like in a local church when Christians together try and strive to do that? Well, that's what Peter moves on to next, where he tells us to love deeply. Verse 22. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love from each other. Now that you've done all this stuff I've just talked about. Now that you really are a forgiven people. What are you to do? Love one another deeply from the heart love one another it's one of the marks of someone who really is one of god's people you see it all through the new testament they will deeply love the other members of their new family we've all been saved by the same word of god the same spirit the same blood and that then frees us up from worrying about our differences and our disagreements and that frees us to really deeply love people that we might otherwise disagree with and not really get on with i just think of the makeup of the churches peter was writing to a mixture of men and women Jews and non-Jews, slaves and free, rich and poor, just about every divide that the first century could have had, they were experiencing. And to a church like that, Peter tells them to love one another deeply. And we can love each other deeply because we've all been born again from something that isn't going to perish. We will never wither or fall. We all got born again through the word of God applied in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And so we can love each other deeply and have real unity that didn't mean they have to all act and think and live in the same type of house and do the same types of jobs have the same family makeups and have the same political opinions as each other that's not unity that's uniformity instead they can have a love that caused unity because it overlooked all of that difference and led them to treat each other as equals and that equality means that we'll behave differently towards each other too look at verse uh, one of chapter two he gives a list of things we're to rid ourselves of These things are all things that come out of the evil desires of our hearts back in verse 14. They spring from our emotions that we're to stop before they get out in our actions. Choosing to gird the loins of our minds means to be obedient to holiness. We will fight the temptation to react to those things when they spring up. He says we're going to run away from malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. So what will that look like? Well, instead of malice, that means we're now free to be kind to each other and generous to each other instead of deceit we're to live truthfully and honestly with each other not hiding things from each other that means we're free to admit hurts and struggles and failings and pain when we feel them instead of being hypocritical we're free to be honest and live genuine lives and live out who we really are in obedience to god's word and how we're feeling and what we're thinking 
We don't have to cope words in holy spiritual language so everyone thinks we're better than we really feel. And instead of envy, we're free to celebrate and rejoice in the success and joys of others. And instead of slander, instead of speaking badly about other people, whether to their face or behind their backs, we're now free to speak lovingly and kindly to each other. And how do we do that? How do we grow in doing all of these things? Chapter 2, verse 2. We need to be craving the pure spiritual milk that we need. Have you ever seen a hungry newborn baby? If you have, then you'll know what they're like. They are desperate for that milk. They will scream and they'll squirm and they'll squawk until they get it. They're not satisfied until they're drinking. And that's the, pe that's the picture Peter gives of how we should be with God's word. We should crave it. And we shouldn't be settling for anything less. In fact, we can't be satisfied by anything less. We are these children Peter's talking about here. So we're not going to be satisfied with anything less than the pure word of God. And if we are, that's a worry. Have you ever seen a baby that doesn't want to drink milk? It's not a good sign. That's not a healthy baby. So how healthy is your appetite at the moment for God's word? Do you crave it? Or is your appetite pretty much gone? And I don't just mean books about God's word or sermons about God's word. They're good things, but they're diluted milk. So how is your appetite? How is your diet for the pure spiritual milk? We need it to remain healthy and to grow. Because the truth is, all of these commands that Peter's given us can sound quite daunting, can't they? Hope fully sounds just exhausting. Live purely sounds impossible. Walking reverently doesn't sound fun and loving deeply sounds harder at some times than others. How are we meant to do all this? Well, we need to be people who are stuck in God's word above all. But we need to remember that Peter was writing to local churches, local groups of people. All of these commands are not given them to do on their own. It's for them to do together with each other. All of these commands are to be done together in community with other believers. That's why we need each other. That's what's made part of this pandemic so hard. Because we can't be with each other. But we need to be cultivating relationships with other Christians who are going to get alongside us and encourage us to live wholeheartedly for God. Encourage us to sacrifice anything we're asked to in the pursuit of living our lives fully for him. And it looks like restrictions aren't going to be changing anytime soon. So maybe we need to be thinking creatively and deliberately about how we can do that with each other as a church. See, like babies that need milk, we need to be reading the Bible together and praying honestly and openly together. That might mean getting over some of our frustrations and our tiredness when it comes to Zoom or phone calls. We need to find ways to be accountable to and for each other. That is part of the way we can live and encourage each other to live holy lives today. If you're struggling to do this, you're not going to be alone. But let's together creatively find ways of reminding ourselves of this hope that we have. Find people who are regularly throughout the week point you in the way to live purely and walk reverently. We've got so much technology to help us. Let's be encouraging each other by refocusing our hope. And if you're not struggling particularly at the moment, which is very possible, Think about how you can sacrificially help others in your church family to do that as well. We need all together to get stuck into God's word, reading about Jesus and what he's done for us, reading about the certain future that we have, reading the Old Testament and seeing what he saved us from. Preparing our minds for battle is such a vivid image, isn't it? But unless we choose to actually get a hold of our thought life and help each other, it just stays as a vivid image. We have to actually do something, not to earn our forgiveness, but because our forgiveness has been won for us. Maybe reading the Bible with somebody sounds daunting to you, but can I encourage you just from personal experience over the last couple of years that it really isn't as hard as it might sound. There's no, there's no mystique about it. Simply find someone to do it with, choose a bit of the Bible, read a bit of it together, and talk about it and pray about it. It's simple. If you want any resources to help that happen, then please get in touch. If you want pairing with someone to read the bible with please get in touch with one of the elders or your home group leaders or someone you know from the church we would love to see a church that is growing in its salvation by getting stuck into god's word together reminding each other of the hope we all have and pursuing pure reverent lives together by loving each other deeply but i want to end with a warning 
Because if you're somebody who's hearing that and thinking, ah, that sounds like a bit of hassle. I'm very busy. Uh, I don't want to do any of that. I can't be bothered. It's not for me. Just have a look at how the ESV translates verses 2 and 3. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If. What a terrifying word. If. You see, if all of this sounds pointless and too much like hard work and you can't be bothered, Peter's got a warning for you. That's not a good place to be. In fact, it might be the worst place to be. God's people want to grow in these areas like obedient children. And if we don't want to do this, we have to seriously ask ourselves the question if we ever have tasted of his goodness in the first place. Thankfully, though, the solution to that problem is also found in God's word. So read it with other people. Be creative about time. No matter how old or young you are, read about this Jesus who hoped fully in the joy set before him, who lived a completely pure life despite every temptation thrown at him, who reverently feared his father in heaven and trusted his leading and who loved deeply, so deeply that he willingly gave his life for us in our place and won our forgiveness and our inheritance for us by taking the punishment we deserve. Spend time looking and thinking and talking about that and all he's won for us and taste and see, maybe for the first time, that the Lord is good. And then let's all together live holy, pure, reverent, loving lives for him. <laughs>